2021 on the Thursday, 6 p.m. Singapore time. This APS e, uh, CECMA series is organized by APSC, supported by the Singapore Cardiac Society, endorsed by EBEC for CME points, in prop collaboration with Bayer. Um, I, a quick introduction, I'm uh, your chair for today, a practicing cardiologist coming out of Singapore, the current president for the Asian Pacific Society of Cardiology, as well as the president for the International Society of Cardiovascular Pharmacotherapy. Our first speaker today is a good friend of mine, Professor Chin Chi Kiong, the director for cardiac pacing and electrophysiology at the National Heart Center Singapore. He's going to speak to us on ESC 2020 AF guideline, management of comorbidities. This will be followed by Professor Renho Koitz, Director, Institute of Clinical Pharmacotherapy, uh, Pharmacology and Toxicology, uh, Charity University Medicine, Berlin, Germany. He's going to speak to us on beyond stroke prevention in AF patients, managing renal impairment and diabetes. Our last and uh, not the least speaker, Dr. Ian Poon, family physician from the Sing Health Passeries Polyclinic, Singapore. He's going to present and speak to a case on atrial fibrillation in the primary care setting. Our esteemed panelists today include Dr. David Quack, senior consultant cardiologist at Pantai Hospital Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, as well as Dr. Xiao Sui Chong, the director of the Pacings and EP section at the National University Hospital, Singapore. A disclaimer, this uh, webinar is copyrighted by the APSC and should not be distributed without the prior permission of the APSC. The views and opinions expressed in this webinar belong to those of the faculty members and do not necessarily represent those of the APSC. The live content of this webinar is made available by Wonder Medicine the APSC Facebook and YouTube pages. For Singapore registered physicians, CME points will be submitted for attendees who are connected throughout the whole duration of this webinar. EBEC grants CME points for attendees who attend the full session for the rest of our regional delegates. You will receive your certificate of attendance upon completing a survey sent via email post webinar. For attendees calling in live, please feel free to uh, type in your questions in the Q&A box and we'll try to answer every question. A pitch for upcoming CME webinars, uh, 16 April, Friday, we have a fellows teaching course, Safe Alive, where Professor Tan Hui Chin will narrate unusual coronary anomalies in the cath lab. A new and exciting series that APSC will be hosting is the APSC Journal Club series, where we will um, have uh, our cardiologists of tomorrow group, the younger cardiologists, present to key uh, uh, opinion leaders on journal club to critically appraise uh, impactful uh, journal articles across Asia Pacific. I want to state today's uh, learning objective. One, to provide an Asian slanted take on the 2020 ESC guideline on atrial fibrillation. Two, to provide updates on the management of AF patients with the usual comorbidities of renal impediment, diabetes, and coronary artery disease in the context of maize reduction. And lastly, to discuss the application of this clinical data and practice guidelines into real life clinical cases, particularly at the primary care level. So let's uh, get started. Uh, with us, we'll welcome Professor Ching to start off his lecture. Thanks, Chikyong. All right, thank you for the kind introduction. Let me share my screen. I hope you see my slide here. Yeah, we see it clearly. Um, All right, so thank you for the kind introduction. My task is to talk on the management of comorbidities in patients with atrial fibrillation with an update or focus on the ESC 2020 atrial fibrillation guidelines. We, we know atrial fib is an increasing phenomenon. We see more and more patients with atrial fibrillation. These are the uh, projected uh, prevalence of uh, diseases 
in the years to come. We know that it will increase because our population ages and we will see more of these patients with their comorbidities. And why do we need to know or treat atrial fibrillation? It's simply because patients with atrial fibrillation are at increased risk of adverse outcomes. You will see that they have a uh, observational 1.3 to 3.5 fold increase of death. They are at increased risk of strokes. Uh, the risk of stroke is five times that compared to friends or folks without atrial fibrillation of the same demographics. Uh, and of note, the strokes they get are often worse than those without atrial fibrillation. In 20 to 30% of patients with AFib, they do suffer from LV dysfunction or heart failure. There is a description of cognitive decline or vascular dementia in this group of patients with atrial fibrillation. Uh, we do know that uh, depression, you know, impaired quality of life, unexpected or unscheduled admission to hospitals or visits to your clinics occurs in 60% of patients and there is an increased rate of annual hospitalization rates. Now, there are numerous factors for atrial fibrillation. This is an interesting disease or a disease that involves participation and care of doctors across the whole spectrum. You have uh, the role of cardiologists. If they have valve disease, they have heart failure, they have CAD, you know, um, subvascular disease uh, requiring aggressive use of statins, reduced cholesterol level. You have the acute physicians, acute management physicians, if they go into acute illness or surgery, triggering atrial fibrillation. And of note, we need uh, the help and the role of a family physician is often underrated. They need, we need them to help treat patients with atrial fibrillation, with hypertension, diabetes, chronic renal diseases, lung diseases, sleep apnea, obesity, smoking, increased alcohol consumption, and such. So it is a, a disease that really requires doctors from full spectrum. Um, one good thing about the uh, ESC 2020 guideline, they have simplified the uh, characterization of atrial fibrillation, and they have a 4S AFib scheme. When someone comes to your clinic with atrial fibrillation, these are the questions we ask. First, is he at risk of strokes? If he's at risk of strokes and there's a chest vest score to score that patient, you start anticoagulation. Number two, how bad are the symptoms? If they are symptomatic, it affects their quality of life, results in unscheduled visits to hospitals and clinics, uh, you may want to titrate the medication to improve quality of life, reduce symptoms. But uh, what is the severity of AFib burden? In those with paroxysmal type of atrial fibrillation, how much of the time are they in atrial fibrillation versus how much of the time they remain in sinus rhythm? And of those in persistent atrial fibrillation, is their ventricular response well controlled? How much of the time do they spend in silent or asymptomatic rapid ventricular response? Because those, uh, those factors predict increased risk of adverse outcomes such as heart failure, you know, um, uh, the reduced effort tolerance, quality of life, and such. And lastly, we ask how bad is the substrate? You know, how bad is the underlying causes that leads to atrial fibrillation? Hence the role of comorbidities the role of imaging to determine atrial cardiomyopathy, whether the atrium is enlarged, whether there is fibrosis, whether there's dysfunction. And there are numerous modalities to assess the severity of substrate. Uh, the most commonly used would be a trans thoracic echo, uh, trans esophageal echo may be used for CT and cardiac MRI and biomarkers may play a role in assessing the severe severity of the substrate. And after assessing the substrate, we ask, uh, we treat this patient with an ABC pathway. A, anticoagulation to avoid strokes. And I, I won't go into the details. B, for better symptom control. And you will need to, we will need to regularly assess their symptoms, their quality of life, optimize their rate control, consider a rhythm control strategy in those who will benefit from it. And last, treat 
comorbidities, cardiovascular risk factor management. Uh, that includes diabetes, hypertension, CAD, heart failure, lifestyle changes such as uh, reducing weight if they are obese, regular exercises, reduction of alcohol, etc. And all these three could be done simultaneously or in parallel. Now, not every AFib patient is the same. This data born is, is born out of the Garfield AFib in the cohort one. And you see that uh, the mean age of 70, uh, hypertension in about four in five patients with a mean age of 70, Strokes occurred in one in 10. You know, they have CAD, they have CCS, they have peripheral vascular disease, they have diabetes. One out of five have diabetes in this Garfield cohort. And one in three patients may have smoked or is a current cigarette smoker. Hence, we really need a multidisciplinary team to look after patients with atrial fibrillation. Uh, let me start with some of the lifestyle measures. Obesity is associated with an adjusted risk of atrial fibrillation. You will see in this chart that those who are obese has the highest rate of cumulative incidence of atrial fibrillation compared to those who are normal or underweight as shown on this chart. Uh, they also increase the risk of ischemic stroke and thromboembolism and death, even when the mean chest vest scores is adjusted for both men or women you'll see that there is a low deflection point at about a BMI of 27, where beyond that, the uh, hazard ratio increases for strokes in men as well as women. Clearly, obesity is a risk factor for atrial fibrillation. And it's shown that if someone is able to maintain or sustain weight loss, it is associated with significant reduction of AFib burden and maintenance of atrial fibrillation. Uh, you could see on this chart, weight loss more than 10% versus weight loss ma maintained you know, uh, at this rate. You will see that uh, the ablation-free, uh, drug-free AFib burden in this study is much better with those with a sustained weight loss. Uh, you will see the same chart in B, weight loss of more than 10% uh, versus the rest has a highest total a free AFib freedom period on follow-up. Now, what, what about alcohol use? Now, alcohol excess in a meta-analysis is shown to be a risk factor for incident AFib, as well as bleeding in anticoagulant patient with a ratio of about uh, just close over here. Uh, you can see that in this meta-analysis, excess alcohol increases the risk of incident atrial fibrillation. Of note, there is a recent New England Journal paper looking at 140 adults with atrial fibrillation and regular alcohol consumption of more than 10 standard drinks per week. They managed to recruit them, randomize them to an abstinence versus a control arm. Abstinence means no alcohol for six months for someone who's been drinking 10 standard drinks per week versus control. Though it's a small group of patients between 70 between each group, you see that the AFib recurrence rate in those who abstain from alcohol was 53% compared to 73% in those who are in control, who continue the regular tipo uh, at the end of the day with a p-value of 0 0.005. And the mean percentage of time in AFib during the six months period was 0.5% versus 1.2%. So alcohol does have a role in incident atrial fibrillation does have a role in reducing the recurrence of AFib and has a role in reducing the percentage of time in atrial fibrillation. Uh, good news, uh, the data suggests that caffeine consumption is not likely to cause or contribute to atrial fibrillation, but the heightened state of awareness may increase the sense of palpitation when one is in atrial fibrillation. Uh, we also notice that in patients who are active, moderate exercise is associated with beneficial effects on cardiovascular health, but the incidence of AFib increased with vigorous physical activity. Uh, with this uh, report, those who are marathon runners 
uh, has uh, has an increased risk of uh, atrial fibrillation of up to 1.27, you know, uh, hazard ratio. It seems that too much of a good thing may not be too good for atrial fibrillation. Moderate exercise is beneficial. Now, these are the, some of the things that we really rely on our primary physicians to help control or help achieve a good outcome. Patients with hypertension have a 1.74 higher risk of developing atrial fibrillation. It, adds to the, it also adds to the complications of atrial fibrillation, in particular strokes, heart failure, and is a factor in Hasselblad score. So strict blood pressure control, in addition to anticoagulation, if indicated, is important to reduce the risk of ischemic stroke and perhaps intracranial hemorrhage. The treatment of blood pressure, uh, hypertension, or the BP guidelines uh, is consistent with current guidelines aiming a BP of 130 over 80 and below to reduce adverse outcomes. Of note, if they require some rhythm control, uh, we would avoid sotolol if they have LV or left ventricular hypertrophy or due to the risk of proarrhythmia. And this is the new or updated guidelines in ESC 2020 AFib guidelines that the attention to good BP control is recommended in patients with AFib, with hypertension to reduce AFib recurrence and strokes, a risk as well as bleeding risk. It's a class one level evidence B recommendation. Now we do know that heart failure uh, is a thromboembolic risk factor in AFib. We are not too sure which is the chicken or the egg, but we do know that in patients with heart failure, if it's reduced ejection fraction, the pressures changes in the left atrium may, may lead to adverse remodeling, enlargement of the left atrium, formations of scars, raised, blood pre raised pressure in the left atrium. And, and, and that could reduce and trigger atrial fibrillation. And atrial fibrillation results in a ineffective or reduced cardiac output, inefficiency of cardiac cycle, a rapid ventricular rate, and, and that causes uh, aggravation of heart failure. In someone with normal EF, he may tolerate the loss of atrial kick due to atrial fibrillation, but really someone with reduced EF, he probably would benefit from atrial systole that contrib contributes to effective cardiac output. So heart failure is a known risk factor and one promotes the other. Uh, we do know that chronic, chronic coronary syndrome increases the risk of AFib by about 60%, especially uh, reported in patients with acute coronary syndrome. And um, factors are multifactorial, be it the effect or the interplay of comorbidities, as well as ischemia at the atrium, changes of pressures within the atrium during acute coronary syndrome. They all have an interplay that results in increase of atrial fibrillation. Uh, diabetes too, uh, prevalence of AFib is at least twofold higher in patients with diabetes compared with patients without diabetes. It's an independent risk factor for atrial fibrillation. And last uh, is sleep apnea, right? The mechanisms of, mechanisms of sleep apnea facilitating AFib is multifactorial. Uh, it, it includes intermittent nocturnal hypoxemia, hypercapnia, changes in the pressure within the thoracic cavities, in the palmy arteries, the palmy veins, perhaps transmitting changes of pressures to the atrial, changes or imbalance of sympathetic vagal stimulation, oxidative stress, inflammation, and neurohumoral activation. Uh, about 50% of AFib patients may have OSA versus 32% with control. And the latest guideline uh, has uh, recommended that the optimal management of sleep apnea should be considered to reduce AFib incidence, AFib progression, AFib recurrences, and symptoms. It's a class 2B indication. It was previously a class 2A. And one of my understanding was that um, 
My good friends in South Korea has also looked at the impact of sleep apnea on atrial fibrillation, and they did not see that strong an association versus non-Asian patients. Um, there might be some changes uh, to, or, or rather, the, also the, those with sleep apnea in the South Korean population are not as obese as those in the uh, non-Asian population. So there is interplay of various factors. So as such, let me just summarize on what's new in 2020 for management of comorbidities. The first, identification and management of risk factors and concomitant disease is recommended as an integral part of treatment in AFib patient, class one level evidence B. Modification of unhealthy lifestyle and targeted therapy of intercurrent conditions is recommended. Um, there is also a mention of opportunistic screening for AFib in patients with hypertension and in patients with obstructive sleep apnea. Um, this is uh, the specific recommendations for the various lifestyle changes and disease uh, entity. Right? Man advice and management to avoid alcohol excess should be considered for AFib prevention and in AFib patients considered for OAC therapy, a class 2A indication. Physical activity should be considered to, to help prevent AFib incidents or recurrence with the exception of excessive endurance exercise, which may promote atrial fibrillation. Uh, these are opportunistic screening in patients with OSA, as well as a uh, re repeat of what was pre mentioned previously that a 2A, 2B recommendation was for optimal management of OSA in patients with atrial fibrillation. With that, I well, thank you for your attention. Thanks, Chikyong. That was um, an amazing and very succinct uh, summary of a lot, a lot of uh, stuff coming out of the latest ESC 2020 AF guidelines. Now, um, I want to take this opportunity over the next couple of minutes to contextualize some of the pointers you have given into the Asian context. I think we want to address the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room, based on your 4S ABC algorithm, really is the bleeding. That I think in Asia, a lot of people are very fearful of when it comes to AF uh, stroke management. So perhaps I can ask an uh, opinion from Dr. David Quack um, what is your view on the assessment of bleeding and how should the folks look at bleeding risk assessment when addressing anticoagulation stroke risk? David, please. You're muted, sorry. So I, I think you, you're absolutely correct. I think um, in Asia, uh, particularly since we have some sort of a historical uh, understanding that uh, among Asian, let's say East Asians, there's a higher risk for intracranial hemorrhage. Uh, there's always been this fear that when you start a patient on any uh, um, anticoagulant, you know, that can actually increase the risk of bleeding. I think what we have known, and I think they've got a lot of uh, re re recent reviews, um, which was done in Korea and in Taiwan, uh, they actually showed that this is actually not the truth. And that, uh, in fact, if you can actually reduce um, with the new NOAC in particular, you can actually reduce the risk of uh, not just stroke, but also uh, intracranial hemorrhage. So I think this is a thing that we need to get across. And I think this is where uh, the primary physician I think plays a role. You need to convince the doctors as well, the, the, the patients, and uh, you know that this is really not the risk. Is it useful to look at their has blood score? I find that it's actually not terribly useful because a lot of the patients who are actually at high risk with the high chest fat score, they tend to have the has blood score that's also very high. But I think it is true that uh, if you have a patient who has got uh, proneness to falls and all that, you have to be a bit more wary. And I think uh, patient education is going to be very important. Thanks. Uh, that's what I say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So just to rehash, uh, I think the idea for AF management is always stroke prevention. And the bleeding risk assessment, whether it's have splat, is to let you be aware that these patients may be a high risk of bleeding, but it's not a caution against starting anticoagulation. It's just to watch out for bleeding. I think that's always been the intent for the guidelines. I want to move on to Professor Coitz. In terms of what you see as a guideline for blood pressure targets of less than 130 over 80, what, what is your advice? Is there any subgroup that is not suitable to go low uh, for BP control? Thank you very much for the question. Also, maybe coming back to the previous question, blood pressure 
it's very important. Uh, the Hesplet score, I share the criticism. Um, uh, on the other hand, we can use it as a reminder and should look into the modifiable risk factors implemented in Hesplet. And at the very beginning is uh, hypertension. Uh, originally, the parameter is systolic blood pressure over 160. Actually, when you look at the data, you know, I'm speaking also as the president of the European Society of Hypertension, you know, it's not so convincing uh, the data and the blood pressure control, even within the studies, you know. One problem is already blood pressure measurement, also proper blood measurement. So I can encourage also the family physicians the blood pressure measurement is very important. You can do it also with your know, uh, novel os oscillometric automatic measurement. Important is that you do repetitive measurements, three at least, if possible, if there's a huge variability, even more so. But nevertheless, I think the target less than 130 uh, in the guidelines, I would confirm and appreciate the target still, you know, even though I think we need more data, prospective data, on optimal blood pressure control during anticoagulation and with pro pro proper blood pressure measurement implemented in the studies. If I may add, other important modifiable risk factors, also talk, speaking as a clinical pharmacologist, are the concomitant drugs. At, on top of the list, the NSAIDs, I think, increasing the bleeding. And that we should carefully uh, investigate, even also some, you know, I mean, in Asia, herbal medicine, traditional medicines, sometimes we do not know whether they are harmful or protective. I think I would encourage also to family physicians to take a complete history of all the drugs. Uh, another drug that actually is ble uh, increases the bleeding risk, a class of drugs is the antidepressant. Antidepressant drugs sometimes we, we need to use in patients with depressive syndromes. Serotonin reuptake inhibitor increase the bleeding risk twofold. Sometimes we cannot avoid, but if we have to use these drugs, it's even more so important to you know take care of the other modifier risk factor. And the last I would like to mention also after Professor Chi Kyung uh, uh, marvelous presentation, alcohol intake, excess alcohol intake, peaks with systolic blood pressure and increases the risk of hemorrhage, intracranial hemorrhage, and that's very important also. Thanks. Thanks for the pharmacological. Uh, can I just uh, interject here? Yeah. I think the, the point about blood pressure is very critical. I think in our, our aging population in Asia, we've always been asked this question is how low can we go? Is the 130, 80 too much a target to, to achieve? Um, particularly if you are prone to, like I said, you know, frailty and what have you. So I think we have to, to play by ear here. It, it's, I don't think you have a real answer to that. Um, but I think we should recognize that some patients will be more sensitive to blood pressure. So I think from the physician point of view, if the patient can be encouraged, and I think in Asia, we have a lot of patients who are now buying the, uh, the very handy home monitoring uh, blood pressure sets. And we actually encourage them to do that. And then they can actually just record it and come and demonstrate to us that their, their blood pressure at home is actually reasonable. And therefore, we don't over treat the patients. Because I think falls um, actually is very important, and especially when you're treating AF and you have a NOAC on top. Um, you know, uh, uh, recently a patient of mine actually had, had a fall and had a subdural hematoma that presented over six months, you know. I mean, these are the things that actually will happen. So I think you have to be very careful. What and do you so think, Ji Kyung? Uh, 130, 80, is it too low? I think we, we probably have to move on from blood pressure. Okay. I think it's an important topic, but... Uh, <laughs> I, I just want to hash it up and just conclude that uh, the ESC currently endorsed 13080 almost spring like, but we use, you heard the hesitancy from both David and Professor Coitz regarding endorsing it upright because I think we have to individualize it in this group of patients who are elderly, multiple comorbidities. I think the take home message should be that the blood pressure control should not be bad, but how low it goes, whether it's to the spring, you probably have to individualize it. So we move on. So the next uh, question I want to ask is opportunistic screening for AF in our subgroup of renal impairment, hypertensive and diabetic. So uh, Sui Chong, should every um, of our patient have an Apple iWatch series four and above? Uh, what, what, what does it mean by opportunistic screening in your mind? Yeah, I think if you have uh, shares in Apple, then certainly the answer will be yes. Uh, but I think that, you know, what, what you're really talking about is to 
take the opportunity to um, you know look at the, do an ECG when they come uh, for a clinic visit for their other uh, medical problems. So when they come and and see the renal physician, they could you know um, do an ECG or simply just uh, measure the blood pressure and you know check the pulse rate. And if, if they find that it's irregular, then they suspect that it's uh, there's atrial fibrillation. Then you know you've caught it. I mean, I think there is a role. Uh, it is helpful to do that, although the pickup rate will necessarily be pretty low, right? I mean, because you are talking about, um, you know, 10 seconds uh, of, of monitoring over, uh, you know, such a long period of time uh, when you are not actually looking. Um, there, there have been some studies done on uh, all this opportunity screening uh, for, for AFib in the community. And uh, I think they have reported pretty good success for, for a community outreach kind of thing. Um, and I, I think it's better than doing nothing, right? I, I think there are a lot of uh, people with AFib out there who are not diagnosed. Thanks, thanks, Sun Chong. I think in the at-risk group, we really depend on our primary physician to at least feel the pulse properly and uh, really pick it up and uh, do an ECG when required. So I, I just want to hop back to a question before I go back to OSA, which was an interesting topic. Uh, Ian, um, I saw on Chikyong's curve, uh, 27 BMI is where the curve takes a steeper dive upwards for males more than females. Uh, do you endorse a BMI of 27 for Asian obesity? Because there are some rough gauge between like 23, 25, now I see for AF particularly is 27. So the thing okay. is AF aside, yeah, AF aside, right, uh, WHO's uh, recommendation for uh, being overweight uh, for Asians is actually 23. Any BMI more than 23 is already considered overweight. Any BMI more than 27 is obese. Now this is independent of whether there's AF or not. I mean, obesity is an independent risk factor for any uh, cardiovascular uh, uh, disease. All right. I mean, I know this talk is about AF, but obesity is uh, simply a, a risk factor for many uh, conditions. And, and they also, many of them have a metabolic uh, uh, syndrome. So it's not just if you have uh, AF with an OSA, then go and look at a BMI. If you go, look, you, you go out in the streets and you look around, you, you can probably identify uh, these patients who have a BMI more than 27 just by looking at them. All right. But of course, in a, in a uh, primary care setting, right, it is routine that anybody with uh, you know, uh, cardiovascular disease uh, get their weight and height and blood pressure measured even before they come to see us. And we can monitor and we can trend this over time. So it's not just like at this point of time, but if let's say your BMI is 27 and you're gaining weight, that's bad, all right? No matter what you say that, you know, I'm eating right and I'm exercising and then I ask them, so how do you gain weight then? All right, then you need to explore a little bit more. So absolutely weight is a very big issue in, in the, in the, in for public health. And more importantly, Chikyong's point then was that a weight loss, uh, not just the weight alone does improve outcomes. I think it also modulates the risk factors for hypertension, diabetes control. Uh, so Chikyong, I want to get back to the sleep and uh, OSA and cardiovascular patients. Uh, I think in a lot of reported series in this subgroup is almost 50% of patients have OSA. But in your AF patients, I understand that AF or heart failure is a contraindication to level three sleep study. So are we going to refer all our patients to the ENT or sleep physicians? So most of the sleep study or obstructive sleep apnea arise from non-Asian patients. And as mentioned, um, in my interaction with my South Korean colleagues, they do not find that a robust association with OSA and atrial fibrillation. Um, and it's multiple factor, multifactorial. Um, Asian patients are not as obese, perhaps, this one. And the mechanics are a little different. So I do not routinely send them for sleep study. I would ask if they have any uh, symptoms, very, very gross uh, assessment of symptoms of sleep apnea, you know, daytime somnolence um, and such. If, if their spouse or their partner is with them, whether uh, they, they snore excessively at night and uh, they have breath holding attacks or behavior at night, then I'll send them. Um, so that's my, my current practice. I have not systematically or routinely sent someone for sleep study yet. Thanks, uh, Chikyong. Just uh, maybe I summarize then we have to move on to Professor Koit's talk. Uh, 
For sleep apnea in Asians, what I learned from our recent webinar with our respiratory physician is this one, 50% of the severe obstructive sleep apnea patients in Asia are not obese. So you, you can't really say that they're obese and therefore you screen for them and they're not obese, they do not have. So you look out for markers like refractory hypertension and uh, screening criteria in Asia works better with the stock bank criteria rather than the app score. So these are some of the peculiarities in Asia. The other thing is that if they do have AF or heart failure, you have to suspect central sleep apnea and a simple level three sleep study is probably not suitable for this uh, category of patients. But in a lot of Asian study, we get mixed results up to 50% of our patients could have adverse outcomes uh, if they have concomitant moderate to severe sleep apnea. So it's a, it's a huge problem as part of the cardiometabolic uh, spread and we'll discuss further in our subsequent lectures. So now we're, we're gonna ask uh, Professor Koitz to start his uh, second lecture on AF and other comorbidities. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to participate. It's a great pleasure and honor for me to talk to you today and uh, participate at your important meeting and uh, discuss some aspects beyond stroke prevention, particularly in patients with atrial fibrillation, diabetes, and uh, renal impairment and chronic kidney disease. So after showing my disclosure, I just would like to start with the <clears throat> prevalence of diabetes. We have seen already some data. Um, it depends on how you look into, you know, if we look into the uh, RCTs, NOACs, 23 to 40% prevalence of diabetes and AF. In the Garfield that has been already mentioned, also something between 22 to 29 or on another registry here or database also. So basically in the same range, uh, let's say uh, about 30%. We all know that diabetes is associated with the classical microangiopathy uh, affecting the, the eye, the kidney, and neuropathy, but you know, cardiovascular disease is the reason why you know, um, the patients die, actually. Eight out of 10 individuals with diabetes die from maize, cardiovascular events, and particularly coronary artery events, but also stroke. And that is definitely as obviously linked also to atrial fibrillation and therefore also diabetes is included as one of the factor with a score of one. Even though when you talk to some diabetologists, they think uh, sometimes claim that the D should you know, deserve a two rather than a one in terms of risk factor. So with regard to the kidney also, depending on the definition, you know, if you say uh, uh, renal impairment starts already with the creatinine clearance less than 90 or 80, or if you use the conventional CKD definition less than 60 milliliter per minute, you have something like every second patient or at least 30% of the patients. Uh, if you look also into the more recent Agathe data, <clears throat> I will show another slide. So about 30% of the patients have chronic kidney disease with atrial fibrillation. And AF also has impact on outcome, on stroke risk, on average, maybe 40% increase, although it's not implemented as an independent uh, risk factor in the chat sweat score, but we very well uh, are aware of that intracranial bleeding is higher in patients with CKD and also all cause mortality is uh, associated with the presence of CKD and definitely in uh, most of the countries, including also your region and also in Europe, North America, now the leading cause of CKD is uh, diabetes together with aging and arterial hypertension. You know, uh, I'm talking here, I'm sitting here in the Charité University of Medicine in Berlin and uh, Rudolf Wirscher was one of the giant the professor of pathology in our institution when at the age of 25, uh, and we, had, we celebrate his birthday because he was born in 1821 this year. At the age of 25, he formulated the, the famous Virchow triad, and that applies also uh, to the thromboembolic risk that as it is increased in patients with AF and chronic kidney disease, there are several factors and also within the triad of Virchow that are affected and contribute to this increased risk of thromboembolic events in patients with CKD and atrial fibrillation. Unfortunately, at the same time, the bleeding risk is increased and there are also 
uh, multiple mechanisms uh, affecting platelet dysfunction, endothelial dysfunction, and also anemia taken together that contribute to the hemorrhagic state in patients with CKD. So it's a, um, a definitely a risky situation. And obviously, when we treat the patients with anticoagulants and other drugs, um, the risk for bleeding, as we have already discussed, may increase. So this is more recent data from Garfield also, the prospective registry. You have seen previous data, and now we have already more than 30,000 patients. And you're just showing the uh, association between AF and CKD in relation to different comorbidities. Hypertension, the most frequent prevalent comorbidity in AF overall. And here you see the presence of uh, diabetes in relation also to CKD, you see that you know that uh, one third of the patients with diabetes ha have chronic uh, kidney disease in atrial fibrillation population. So it's a very prevalent uh, association between diabetes, chronic kidney disease, and atrial fibrillation. So the uh, impact of uh, moderate to severe kidney disease in patients with newly diagnosed AF is also analyzed again in Garfield, this huge prospective population-based registry. And if you compare to the patients without the CKD, Asians with the rest of the world, there's actually in the patients with comorbid mild CKD is an increase in risk in patients for mortality in the rest of the world population, but not with the Asian population. But in patients with moderate to severe CKD, you know, the risk is uh, substantially increased in patients uh, from, the, uh, from uh, Asia, uh, so uh, highlighting again the clinical importance of CKD and that we should manage CKD and very importantly prevent the development of uh, moderate to severe CKD in this population. So beyond the classical outcome in patients with diabetes uh, in terms of uh, reduction of MACE and uh, reduction of major bleeding, here's a, 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 a registry, a real world study. Uh, showing from the United States the impact of uh, a NOAC, in this case, Rivoxaban, as compared to warfarin or BKA. You see no significant difference, if anything, a tad uh, run to a, a better improvement uh, with the NOAC, but obviously also the reduction in intracranial bleeding, not significant, although uh, always we see 40 to 50 percent reduction in um, uh, bleeding in the patients also at high risk with diabetes. But another aspect I do not want to go into detail is also the protection of uh, the limbs, the major adverse limb events. And you see that they, you see here a clear uh, a benefit in those patients that are treated with uh, NOAC as compared to the warfarin. And that also brings me to some of the aspects I would like to talk to you uh, beyond stroke prevention, also protecting the kidney. Maybe they are similar pathophysiological or mechanistic background protecting the, the, um, the vasculature also in the peripheral artery disease as well as in the kidney. So clearly in the nicely discussed already ABC pathway in the new guidelines ESC, the comorbidities, CKD and diabetes are prevalent, very often together, occur together in patients with EF and to protect the kidney is uh, very important because it would have impact not only on quality of life if the patient uh, eventually end up in end-stage kidney disease, but it has a significant impact also on outcome. So this is a, a perspective uh, with regard to the um, development during the last years uh, in terms of uh, uh, and the, the decrease in renal function over time. What you see here is the decrease in glomerular filtration rate per year and how we can protect the kidney by uh, proper blood pressure control. Again, blood pressure control also very important for the kidney in patients with diabetic nephropathy. And uh, basically th these are data when we started in the last century in the 1990s, uh, there was a major development in two, 2000 when uh, proper blood pressure control and use of RAS inhibitors, ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers provided the backbone of therapy, like the treatment in hypertension, also in patients with diabetic kidney disease. And here the dots, you see the single studies. So better blood pressure control protects the kidney 
So the smaller is the decrease, annual decrease in EGFR over time. And there are now also new game changers here. Everybody's discussing in patients with diabetes and chronic kidney disease, and in the future possibly also in patients with chronic kidney disease uh, without diabetes. The, one of the game changers are SGLT2 inhibition, and it's one of the first studies presented here, the Credence study. You know, you see a further protection uh, blood pressure control, good blood pressure control on top of RAS inhibitors, uh, further protection of the kidney with an uh, annual decline in the range of two milliliter per minute only. And another game changer could be in the future the non steroidal aldosterone antagonist, uh, phenarenone, that has just recently last year been published in the context of the Fidelio study. But what I would like to discuss now is that in patients with atrial fibrillation, how could the type of anticoagulation also impact on this development in terms of deterioration of renal function over time with aging and could we protect the kidney also by using anticoagulants or selection by the selection of anticoagulants. And the classical link between um, uh, vascular function and anticoagulants is very well known. It's brought about by the uh, calcification of the arteries. You know that we have arcification. I will show you next slide in the intima and also in the media. And they share a common pathophysiology, but also some differences. But what is important here in the calcification of the arteries, particularly in the media and the stiffening of the arteries is the, uh, uh, that we have uh, endogenous protect, uh, inhibitors or protectors against calcification. Among those are a major protein is the matrix GLA protein. And matrix GLA proteins are, or GLA proteins are proteins that are vitamin K dependent. And MGP is a vitamin K dependent protein that links us to anticoagulation. And the role of MGP, I think, is clearly shown if we look into a knockout mouse, which is a classical experiment in basic research. So if you have the wild type, you can barely see it and stain the aorta of wild type mice for calcium, you don't see a, a red color here, almost not visible, but if you stay in a knockout mouse for MGP, they do not have to protect her against vascular calcification anymore. You see the red staining here indicating severe calcification. And you see in the couple of microbes, these mice die very early after 40 to 50 days because of vascular complications um, due to the calcification. So matrix GLA protein is very important. It helps us to protect the vascular smooth muscle layer, the media against vascular calcification and may possibly also in the intima in the plaques. So in summary, we have this calcification processes ongoing driven by inflammatory processes, particularly in atherosclerosis plaques, but we have also the media calcification and it's highly prevalent in patients with CKD and the major driver is also diabetes. So in these patients that are prone to develop this type of vascular injury, possibly to use a vitamin K antagonist is not so good, it's not a good idea because vitamin K will also inhibit the activation of the matrix GLA protein because matrix GLA protein belongs to the family of vitamin K dependent proteins and it will not be carboxylated, gamma carboxylated, if we treat the patients with the VKA. And if it's not active MGP, it cannot protect as much the vascular anymore and cannot inhibit uh, calcification. So therefore the hypothesis would be that the use of VKA would actually contribute to vascular injury and uh, vascular calcification. And because renal function and uh, in the context of diabetes and aging, uh, is also driven by vascular injury it is very important. That could also provide a link to chronic kidney disease. So if we put this together, vascular calcification and uh, renal injury, classical risk factor for this is very well known are diabetes with several factors that contribute to the risk, hyperglycemia, advanced glycation, end products, ECM degradation, inflammatory processes, oxidative stress, RAS activation, and CKD with uh, uh, changes in the calcium phosphate product, vitamin K deficiency in these patients are very often occurring and also in patients uh, on end-stage kidney disease with the uremic toxins particularly. Other demographic factors are increased age, 
male sex, uh, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and smoking that contribute to vascular injury calcification and thereby possibly also to uh, renal impairment. Now, vitamin cantagonists in terms of drug treatment may also accurate these processes based on the rationales I have discussed with you mediated by MGP. So in the angiology uh, uh, community, it's very well known long, that long-term treatment VKA, such as shown in this uh, nice small uh, case control study where patients in an outpatient clinic have been followed up for many years and the investigator just looked at simple x-rays of the lower extremities in this match cohort analysis and compared patients with warfarin treatment and without VKA treatment. And you see just the presence of arterial calcification in the simple x-rays was significantly increased after long-term treatment for more than five years in those patients treated with warfarin as compared to control. We also looked into a huge database in Germany and the GP patients actually um, database and include patients with atrial fibrillation and CKD stage three and four, and just compared the patients that were treated with uh, in the setting of atrial fibrillation with a vitamin K antagonist in the matched control and compared to those not treated with vitamin K antagonist. And you see um, uh, over five years again, observation period, uh, uh, accelerated on more severe decline in renal function over time and those patients treated with VKA, possibly linking again the pathophysiology, vascular injury to also renal injury and renal function decline. More recently, an elegant study has been reported from Denmark looking into uh, 17,000 uh, subjects from Denmark. You know, in Denmark, they have a huge national database where patients uh, where the subjects had uh, previously with non-pre-existing uh, cardiovascular disease, but because of symptomatic or uh, screening approaches have been analyzed by CT calcium score scans. And, now, and then they looked into the database, uh, matched uh, the patients in the setting that were using, were treated uh, with vitamin K antagonist, uh, 1,748 patients, or with the NOAC, 1,144 uh, uh, patients mean age in this overall cohort was 67 years. And when the investigator analyzed the calcium scores as summarized in this slide and the overall cohort, he will see the patients that are not treated with VKAs. And these are the patients that are under long-term treatment with VKA for more than five years. And what you see here, the pattern of shift of pattern uh, in terms of calcium scoring. Green is no calcification, Red is a high calcium score and high risk in the coronary artery. And you'll see that there's definitely, if those, in those patients with long-term treatment with VKA, uh, less patients with a, a zero calcium score and more patients with a more pronounced calcification. And overall, the investigators found a significant association between age and duration of treatment with VKA and coronary artery calcium. Uh, uh, coronary uh, artery calcification. While not shown because they do not even present a, a figure in their paper because there were absolutely no association between CAC and the use of NOACs. So again, supporting the idea that long-term treatment of VKA can lead to vascular damage and impact on cardiovascular risk and also on the kidney. While on the other hand, uh, NOACs definitely could be neutral because they have no impact based on their mode of action because all the 10A inhibitors are selective for inhibition of factor 10A and uh, WGAT aren't selective for the inhibition of thrombin. Uh, they have no impact influence on matrix clar protein in terms of gamma cover exhalation, that's obvious. But they may even have some protective effects beyond the classical anticoagulatory effect and that has been nicely now shown also for Rimoxaban in terms of the poten potential to inhibit protease uh, receptor activation, such as uh, mediated by the PAR1, but also by the PAR2. PAR1, we know very well, is the important receptor on the platelets. And Petzold Group from Munich has nicely shown in this circulation research paper that uh, rivoxaban can inhibit the activation 
uh, of uh, platelets uh, via uh, factor 10a via the PAR1 receptor. And, and in addition to this, uh, we have to put this into perspective that we know that activated platelets are also involved and may contribute to endothelial in injury and endothelial dysfunction. They are also mediators in terms of inflammatory processes. So that could be a potential beneficial effect if we could uh, inhibit this uh, activation of platelets also by using factor 10 A inhibitor in, in addition to the classical anticoagulatory effect brought about by 10 A inhibition. And these PAR receptors, PAR1 and PAR2, we know that they are active, uh, activated by factor 10 A. They are expressed in different cells, not only in the platelets, but also in uh, inflammatory cells, in the endothelium, uh, vascular smooth muscle cells, adipocytes, but also in the kidney and the podocytes, and also in the intestine. And there are a lot of animal studies now or in vitro cell culture studies that uh, provide the basis that uh, factor 10 A inhibition by inhibiting PAR1 and PAR2 in these cell types may contribute to or may uh, actually result in beneficial uh, effects, including in animal models, as it has been shown uh, uh, with regard to kidney damage. So now at the end of the talk, let me briefly discuss you some uh, data, observational data supporting this hypothesis in, in the clinical setting in patients with atrial fibrillation. So this was, I think, uh, maybe the first study that uh, you know, attracted a lot of uh, interest in the community because when Yao reported this, they showed for the first time that if you compare NOAX versus warfarin in the real world setting in patients with atrial fibrillation, you compare uh, the NOAX apixaban, dabigatran, and rivaroxaban, you see here the numbers of patients included uh, as compared to warfarin, 4,185 patients, and look, at the classical renal outcomes, decline in EGFR, at least 30%, doubling of serum creatinine, acute kidney injury, and kidney failure. They observed uh, no effect for apixaban, but significant, or at least a trend for all four outcomes in terms of a benefit with the NOAC treatment for both dabigatran and uh, rivaroxaban. We see acute kidney injury, or doubling of serum creatinine significantly decreased and also a trend for less kidney failure. So apparently NOAX protect the kidney as compared to warfarin. The same has been uh, uh, presented in an independent study by Greg Coleman, also in the United States. Uh, when they included patients with AFF, they excluded at the beginning patients with stage five CKD because the goal was to check for progression towards stage five CKD or the presence of AKE in patients with atrial fibrillation, comparing a huge number of patients in the real world setting, 36,000 patients, Rivaroxaban matched to warfarin. Again, a significant hazard ratio reduction of 19 to 80% in terms of the risk for acute kidney injury or stage five chronic kidney injury development or patients the, uh, uh, the need for dialysis in patients. Finally, if we look into the patients with diabetes, there's a, another uh, real world study that has been published in patients with atrial fibrillation and diabetes. We know they are at higher risk to develop uh, a, a kidney injury. And if you would compare, if I don't go back now, the event rates in, in the diabetic patients as compared to the previous slide, uh, patients, the overall cohort of patients with AF. And you see here that the event rates actually are higher. The risk is higher for acute kidney injury or the risk to develop CKD5 uh, or ending up on hemodialysis and diabetics. But again, what you see here in those patients in blue treated with a factor 10A inhibitor show a benefit, a significant risk reduction in terms of uh, protection against acute kidney injury and also protection against CKD5 and uh, development of or the need of uh, hemodialysis. So taken together, I think we have now uh, this picture. I draw this graph um, a while ago, uh, trying to visualize the concept that we obviously with aging and particularly in the high risk patients, and these are vascular patients, OIF patients, we have a decline in renal function. And this is particularly important in patients with already pre-existing chronic kidney disease as shown here and diabetes. 
And if we treat them with anticoagulants, we may in, in introduce a different differential impact here, while VKA treatment will result in a higher frequency of acute kidney injury events and a higher risk and an accelerated decline renal function towards the development of end-stage kidney disease. This may be uh, ameliorated by treatment with the NOAC because less AKI events and less um, progression of kidney disease and uh, the pathophysiological mechanistic uh, aspects behind this, I tried to uh, discuss with you in my presentation. So finally, uh, I, I think we know very well now, if we look into the whole, uh, random mass control trials and also the observation data, in the RCTs, in the pivotal phase three studies, that is with the NOACs, clearly the, UAC, the oral anticoagulation reduced the risk of uh, thromboembolic events, and the NOACs were at least not inferior also in patients with renal impairment. However, uh, patients with stage four, or definitely stage five, more advanced chronic kidney disease were excluded in all the randomized controlled trials. So we do not have here randomized controlled um, uh, trial evidence. But nevertheless, we have observational evidence uh, with all the limitations. And I just showed you just a few studies. They show at least a similar effectiveness in terms of uh, 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 reduction of um, um, uh, thromboembolic events. I didn't show you the details because of time reasons. Uh, but uh, they also show less bleeding, particularly less intracranial bleeding uh, associated with the NOACs. But what I discussed with you today is that the use of NOACs is also potentially associated with the reduced risk for renal events, uh, less decline in EGFR, and a lower event rate in, for acute kidney injury and uh, end-stage kidney disease. And I think that is also very important in our aging population uh, in this context of atrial fibrillation. At the very end, I would like to show you um, one slide, uh, a study we are just analyzing right now. We are waiting for the data. And because there are not so many prospective studies going on, this is a prospective reg registry. There's a similar registry actually going on in South Korea, the Xarino study. We are doing the Xarino study with some 15, 1600 patients. And we have there in a non-interventional uh, manner uh, included Vivoxaban patients versus VKA patients, also some patients that are not anticoagulated at the discretion of the physician. First results were presented at the American Heart. The only point I would like to mention here that we have a substantial number of patients with severe chronic kidney disease, less than EGFR. But if we look now how they are treated and the study is conducted in Europe, uh, uh, we see that the, the majority of patients twofold uh, as compared to uh, Levoxaban group receive VKAs in this patient group with severe renal impairment. Uh, while uh, the data we have obtained in the meantime would support the idea that particularly these patients actually could benefit from the treatment from uh, um, uh, a NOAC factor 10A inhibition particularly because the, the kidney could be protected possibly by this. But that has to be shown and uh, we have to wait for the results. Uh, and thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, uh, Prof. Uh for that uh, very comprehensive lecture on the major comorbidities of renal impairment. Um, before we delve into that topic for the next couple of minutes before the next lecture, I would just like to clarify one of the questions uh, by Dr. Nlai Ping. Probably Chikyong can answer this. Uh, the new guidelines stated that SOTA law is probably not advisable for patients with AF and LVH and heart failure. Um, what is your clinical advice for patients who are already on SOTALOR? Sorry, Chikyong, you're muted. So SOTALOR is a class 3 antiarrhythmic drug. It is used for the purpose for rhythm control strategy in patients with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. All right, some of the contraindications would be LVH, usually more than 1.4 centimeters thickness because they may be proarrhythmic and causes TOSAT or polymorphic VT. Hence, in the use or prescribing of AAD antiarrhythmic drugs, safety rather than efficacy is the main guiding principle. Uh, so in a patient with SOTALOR, um, we normally would make sure that the EF is not reduced, there's no LVH, before we start someone on SOTALOR. As mentioned, 
safety rather than efficacy is the main guiding principle in rhythm control strategy with anti arrhythmic drugs. Thanks, Over so, to you, Jack. Uh, yeah, thanks for taking that question uh, quickly. Uh, I'd like to then contextualize uh, Prof Coit's talk into the Asian context and into primary care setting. Uh, Ian, I, I think in Asia, a large percentage of CKD patients are due to comorbidities like hypertension, even more so than diabetes. And uh, particularly in Asia as well, where the control may not be that hot. In a primary care setting, how do you screen for CKD? So every patient with any uh, cardiovascular disease, that, that uh, means uh, hypertension, uh, hyperlipidemia, um, uh, and diabetes, uh, they get an annual panel, which would include a renal panel. So the, uh, they'll do a baseline one, okay, on, upon diagnosis, and subsequently uh, every year at least. Now, if it's raised, uh, you probably want to do it uh, a bit more frequently because you want to know whether it is something uh, subacute or is it something that's chronic and stable. Because if the creatinine is rising, you, you should look hard for uh, any reversible causes. Thanks. So also not forgetting a simple dipstick, like checking for protein real on top of that. I think yes, that's um, Yeah, sorry. So included in the panel, I, I forgot to mention, besides the renal panel, uh, we do an ACR as a standard, uh, uh, you know, screening. Thanks, Ian. Uh, I, I'd like to get some opinion from David after listening to Prof. Coit's lecture. In a subgroup of patients with AF and renal impairment, especially CKD5 or dialysis, are you convinced enough then that uh, the patient should receive NOAC therapy versus warfarin? I think uh, we, we just actually, uh, last week, we just had a discussion on this uh, another group. Um, and I think the problem we have is that most of the uh, NOAC studies uh, and the, the RCTs, they actually excluded those that are on hemodialysis or in uh, you know, class 4B and below, I mean, below the I mean, 25, I think or some are 30 for the GFR, EGFR. So because of that, actually, nobody knows if it is safe or otherwise. And I think nephrologists are not yet convinced that, you know, they should be put on any treatment. So some, you'll see that, uh, I think the same uh, study that was actually shown by uh, Prof. Koitz that uh, there are some who are not receiving any anticoagulant anyway. Okay, the only anticoagulation they get is their heparin during the, the hemodialysis. And then after that, uh, they are left on their own. Well, some of them prefer to use warfarin. But I think uh, the, the couple of studies that I think Prof. Koitz has actually highlighted may be maybe we need to disseminate that more. It, it looks very promising. I mean, I'm, I'm quite happy with the kind of results to see that it is not doing more harm, it's not causing more, more bleeding. And it may actually you know, improve vascular uh, function. I mean, particularly you know, the, the lesser calcification, you know, and, and I think the lesser inflammatory process for the patient. So maybe in the long term, uh, it may help some of the younger, I suspect, uh, uh, kidney uh, failure patients. Thanks, uh, David. I think I hear a lot of maybe in your answer. Yes. So I think for <laughs> unlike the SGLT piece where we probably need a DAPA CKD light trial yes. to look at heart outcomes uh, for the NOAC piece for us uh, to be convinced. Uh, maybe uh, Chikyong can just take this quickly in the ESC 2020 guidelines. What is the advice to physicians regarding CKD? Well, um, I must say, I, I, I don't recall seeing the CKD as in those with a, a stage four and below. It sticks to the drug labeling thus far. If someone is stage four with, with a GFR of 15 to 29 or end stage renal failure, I think the recommendation is still not clear on that because there are data and there are current trials. Maybe I would uh, defer to. Uh, yeah. our so esteemed speaker. I, I think this is a relevant question because I think uh, FDA did approve the use of Pixaban based on non-randomized data. I'm going to direct this question at Professor uh, Koitz, but uh, real Roxaban, Pixaban, quite similar pharmacodynamics. Uh, some and my stakeholders are quite split on the safe use of it uh, over warfarin in the end-stage renal failure hemodialysis subgroup. So perhaps uh, Prof. Kurtz can give some advice on its use in the dialysis patient. Mm. Yes, first of all, I, we, 
it's very important. We have to differentiate dialysis versus non-dialysis, okay? The question on dialysis always comes up. I would like to answer, I'm happy to answer this. I have a clear personal view on this, but this is not the important question. The important question is for the huge population with severe chronic kidney disease, increasing population, less non-end stage kidney disease, less than 30 milliliter per minute. They have been excluded from the RCTs. There are no planned RCTs. So we have, unfortunately, to rely on observational data. But the, we have a lot of now observational data and they show in the totality the same result. The effectiveness in terms of form by embolic events reduction is similar compared to warfarin or VKA. The bleeding risk is reduced. And the new data we have, I've shown to you is that they, even the kidney will benefit from the NOAC treatment. This is observational and we hope we can add with some data on this. The dialysis question is also very important, but it's not the major question because the, you know, the, the dialysis question, I mean, my personal answer is the question to anticoagulate or not is unclear. And that's also in the guidelines. Yep. That's, I, the key, I that's, the key, that's, that's the key question. And there's only one study ongoing, only one registry I'm aware of registered in the database in France that are addressing this question. And in terms of the small safety trial, 850 patients, anticoagulation versus placebo, no anticoagulation. Also, we have to uh, um, you know, uh, realize that the dialysis patients are very different and heterogeneous. Asians are different from the Europeans. A patient, a young patient on dialysis with glomerular nephritis, atrial fibrillation for whatever reason, but good health status, low vascular injury is a different patient from an end stage kidney patient after with diabetes and hypertension, etc. So also very difficult. So this question is unclear and highly controversial in the nephrology community, but the patients non end stage yet we have the labeling in the most parts of the world down to 50 milliliter per minute for the 10A inhibitors, which has a very good pharmacological basis because they do not accumulate that much. And therefore we have observational data because they are available in the market and the observational data, as I told, or I, I, I discussed similar Effectiveness, less bleeding, potentially protecting the kidney. That's the data we have. And we will not see randomized controlled trials in the near future, unfortunately. So thanks, uh, Prof. Kois. I think just to quickly uh, recap, I think the dialysis group has always been excluded in all the trials, especially yeah, yeah. Uh, failure. failure. Um, and there's so many differences. It's quite heterogeneous. The difference between hemo versus peritoneal dialysis, et cetera, et cetera. So I like the answer that we don't know. So I think we yeah. probably have to yeah. have uh, yes. more discussion and really has to be individualized. And the guidelines are as well unclear because there's not enough good evidence. So uh, I apologize to Ian. We have only last 15 minutes. I'll ask Ian to present his case and probably just narrate to the case uh, itself so we can have a discussion right to close out okay. today's wonderful right. session. Yeah. Thanks, Ian. I'm going to share screen. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, uh, Ian. Okay, so share and yeah. So, okay, with the limited time that I have, uh, let me see if I can do this. Yeah, we okay. see Mr. K on the screen, yeah. Yeah, okay, so anyway, so I'm, I'm a family physician from Singapore, so that's the context. And I'm just gonna discuss this uh, 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 hypothetical case that uh, we may encounter in the primary care. So Mr. K is a 68 year old male gentleman. He has diabetes, hypertension, lipids, and obesity. So he clearly has the metabolic syndrome. He's a non-smoker and he came to you for a routine visit and he has no symptoms. Uh, but he says that, you know, sometimes when he measures his blood pressure at home with his digital blood pressure set, he gets on and off errors where the blood pressure doesn't, the set doesn't give him a reading, it just gets him an error, okay? And last week, uh, he happened to borrow a, a Fitbit from a friend and he said that it said something abnormal about his reading, but he wasn't sure what it was, uh, and he didn't bring the watch with him. Uh, he's known to be a, uh, to have some mouth anxiety. So he's a fairly well-controlled uh, diabetic. He's not on a lot of medications, 
His A1C is uh, 6.9%, his blood pressure is well controlled, and his LDL is uh, 1.8, right? And this was his ETG when, uh, when we saw him. And you can quite clearly see that uh, the QRS complexes are irregular. You don't see a P wave and the baseline is uh, also irregular. So this patient has uh, atrial fibrillation. So uh, as mentioned before, the uh, incidence of atrial fibrillation is increasing. A study in China in 2015 showed that the prevalence of uh, silent atrial fibrillation is about 3.5% in those more than 65 years old. And many of them have no symptoms. Uh, atrial fibrillation accounts for about 7% of our stroke locally in Singapore, and the, the risk increases uh, with a higher chat bar score. Uh, and it also uh, uh, is a risk factor for heart failure and vascular dementia, as mentioned before. And diabetes, hypertension, heart failure, obesity, age, and hyperthyroid uh, are all risk factors for atrial fibrillation. So it was mentioned before about screening for asymptomatic uh, uh, atrial fibrillation. So if you look at the uh, European guidelines in 2016, that was five years ago, uh, it does uh, mention that at least for those more than 65 years old, you might want to just uh, screen uh, for asymptomatic atrial fibrillation with either an ECG or with a pulse check. And, and I think it was mentioned uh, that, you, that the pickup won't be great because you're only screening for about 10 to 15 seconds, uh, but it's better than nothing. And uh, I would say that from personal experience, we do have some pickups of asymptomatic, asymptomatic uh, atrial fibrillation if we just bother to uh, check the pulse of our patients when they come in. And sometimes nowadays when, with all these uh, digital blood pressure sets, we forget to check the pulse of the patient ourselves. Now, I'm not sure if you're aware that many of our blood pressure sets actually have an atrial fibrillation detector. So these are two very common brands that we have in uh, Singapore, the Nissi brand and as well as the Omron brand. And you will see on their box, right, both of them actually have a atrial fibrillation detector. But doctors and patients need to be aware of it because when the indicator comes out and you don't know what it means, you could sometimes just ignore it or dismiss it, right? And of course, now with uh, wearable devices, right, we mentioned about the Fitbit. And sometimes a Fitbit can also pick up uh, atrial fibrillation. So what have we learned so far? That atrial fibrillation is often asymptomatic and increases with age. And we should consider a pulse check in asymptomatic uh, patients, especially if they are more than 65 years old, or with other comorbidities uh, such as a stroke. Okay? And various uh, home monitoring devices can pick up atrial fibrillation, including digital blood pressure tests, as well as an Apple Watch or uh, Fitbit. Okay, and sometimes when the phone blood pressure repeatedly indicates that uh, it cannot uh, record the blood pressure, it may be due to atrial fibrillation, especially if the atrial fibrillation is fast. And we should not just say, oh, it's a defective uh, machine, right? We might have to uh, investigate a bit further. And even if you do the ECG and it's normal, if there's enough suspicion to suspect that there may be atrial fibrillation, for example, the patient uh, complains of repeated uh, palpitations that last for more than a few minutes, you might still want to uh, refer the patient uh, for a hotel or telemetry, especially if he has uh, cardiovascular risk factors uh, uh, as well, as we realize that atrial fibrillation increases with, uh, with all the other cardiovascular diseases. Okay, so what do we do next now that we have diagnosed uh, atrial fibrillation in the primary care setting? First of all, we need to uh, assess how stable the patient is. What are the symptoms? Is the patient breathless, dizzy, low blood pressure, uh, very high blood pressure, very fast or slow heart rate? Uh, if the patient is stable, then we want to uh, risk the pa uh, risk score the patient uh, using the chart bar score to decide whether the patient should be anticoagulate or not. And then we have to decide if we are going to anticoagulate, whether we're going to use the vitamin K antagonist or a NOVAC. So it's important to ask about metallic heart valves or moderate to severe mitral stenosis. If there's no such history, uh, you can auscultate the heart to look for a, a mid-diastolic murmur, which may suggest mitral stenosis. And you also might want to look at the, the CKD status, especially CKD5. Okay? And after that, you want to do a HESBAT score okay, to assess the bleeding risk. As mentioned before, a high HESBAT score is not a contraindication to starting anticoagulation, but rather it is uh, uh, to give you an awareness to modify and mitigate the risk for bleeding once you start the anticoagulant. And we should not assume that the patient or family would prefer to avoid bleedings than to get a stroke, even if the patient is very old and frail. And we should discuss the risk benefits with the patient. 
Okay, the baseline workup for a new AF would be a ECG, uh, possibly with a long strip. And we also should do a thyroid function test because hyperthyroid is associated with AF. We want to do a liver function test because chronic liver uh, failure can be uh, a factor for uh, coagulate, coag coagulopathies. Okay, we want to know the renal status as mentioned, uh, you know, because it can affect the outcome of, of the patient. And uh, we want to know, do a baseline hemoglobin because of uh, uh, possible bleeds in the future. And we also want to screen for other cardiovascular risk factors if it's not already done. So this is the chart bar score. In Singapore, uh, we don't use gender as in female as a risk factor. Uh, so if we take away the female, then the chart bar score of zero uh, means that we can still observe the patient. If the chart bar score of one, you can consider anticoagulants, especially if, if it's a lady or if the age is more than 65 years old. And if the chart bar score is two, then it is uh, definitely recommended for the prevention of stroke. So uh, these are what our, our patient, Mr. K, has. So he has a, um, you know, uh, at least a chart bar score of three. So he should be put on an anticoagulant. So the HESPED score uh, is, is shown here. And you can see that uh, if a score of more than three uh, would put a person at risk of about four, uh, 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 risk of four of, uh, per 100 uh, uh, patient years of, of a significant uh, uh, bleed. Right. We want to first identify the modifiable risk factors. So the one that's circled in orange, for example, hypertension, labor INR, if the person is on um, warfarin or any certain drugs. Uh, if we can modify this, like lower the blood pressure or stabilize the INR, we can actually reduce the patient's uh, risk of bleeding. Okay. There's a partial modifiable risk factor in the HES flat. Uh, as you can see in the A is uh, uh, kidney disease as well as uh, chronic liver disease. Sometimes if it's an AKI, if it's a transient rise in, in the uh, uh, creatinine, uh, for example, due to dehydration or due to an NSAID, uh, then it can be potentially uh, uh, modifiable and reversible. Okay, so what's the pros and cons of uh, NOEX versus Warfarin? For uh, NOEX, uh, do not need to have any monitoring for time to therapeutic range. So we don't have to worry. We know that once you're on Warfarin, you need to have a high a percentage of time in therapeutic range. We don't need to worry about that in uh, when you're on NOEX. There is less drug to drug and drug to food interaction, and the dose of the drug is fixed. We don't have to worry about warfarin uh, having uh, taken every other day a certain dose, uh, you know, and having to titrate uh, every few weeks. Uh, so warfarin, uh, sorry, uh, NOEX is a much easier uh, and much more stable drug to start. It gives you the same or even better stroke prevention and less intracranial uh, bleeds. The cost is that it's more expensive. In Singapore, it costs about three Singapore dollars a day. That's about four US dollars a day. But certain patients uh, who are uh, identified as needy uh, can be referred to our medical social worker for up to 50 to 75% government subsidy for these medications. Uh, it cannot be used, or well, at least uh, controversial, in the more advanced uh, CKD stage. And it can't be used in patients with mechanical heart valve or moderate to severe mitral stenosis. And some might say that there is no reversal uh, agents. Uh, however, because of the short heart life, half life, it can pretty much uh, turn itself off with time. So these are just a summary of the findings of the major uh, NOAC trials versus warfarin. And you could see that across the board, all NOACs were equal, either equal or better to, than warfarin in all these aspects of safety. Okay, and specifically, all of them uh, resulted in less intracranial bleeds versus warfarin. Okay. So Mr. K was put on a NOAC, but unfortunately, three years later, he developed an uh, NSTEMI. And so what do the guidelines say about uh, anti-clitus and anticoagulants uh, post-PCI? Well, you can see that, uh, uh, you know, if, if you are on the three uh, uh, medications in your triple therapy, uh, there'll be a lot more bleeding, right? So, uh, but if you are on less, then the, the, your first, you have to balance against uh, the thrombotic risk. So in general, NOAC regimes, uh, bleed less than the BKA uh, regimes uh, and dual anticoagulants uh, or try say antiplatelets plus anticoagulants would bleed less than triple but although there is a numerical increase uh, in the number of uh, thrombosis but it did not reach a statistical uh, significance. So this is the summary of, of uh, the guidelines of course as to how long uh, each uh, therapy uh, whether it's triple, dual or monotherapy uh, uh, for anticoagulants and antiplatelets after PCI it also depends on number one, the thrombotic risk, as well as number two, the bleeding risk. But as a general guide, 
for the first month, a uh, person will be on triple therapy that is on an anticoagulant and a dual antiplatelet, which is a, a P2512 uh, inhibitor plus aspirin. Then up to six to 12 months post uh, uh, PCI, uh, they will just be on the P2Y12 uh, inhibitor, uh, for example, clopidogrel and the anticoagulant. And anything beyond uh, one year, they can just be on the anticoagulant. Okay, so what's the learning point so far? Novax are still preferred over vitamin K antagonists because they result in less bleeds. And if a vitamin K antagonist is used uh, post PCI, then because they are also on the uh, antiplatelets, they need to be their iron iron needs to be kept at a lower range of two to two point five. And sometimes that is like threading a, a thread through a needle. It can be pretty hard to maintain a patient in such a narrow therapeutic uh, range. Triple therapy uh, should be kept uh, for up to a, year, uh, a month and then subsequently dual therapy up to a year. And thereafter, uh, you can take off the uh, antiplatelets and just keep the patient on anticoagulants. Okay, that's my last slide. Thanks, uh, Yen. That was uh, wonderful. And uh, you summarized a lot of points there. And I think we, uh, you, you did it very accurately. Just a quick uh, rehash. Uh, at APSC, we also endorse uh, CHATS VAS call right, and CHATS VAS. Uh, just to make it simpler, so we took gender out of it uh, uh, based on our consensus uh, statement across uh, Asia PAC. Um, I just maybe like uh, David to answer this question from Dr. Ng Lai Ping again. Uh, when the patients are dropping in terms of the EGFR going down to CKD stage 5, do you then switch a patient out from NOAC to warfarin? Normally, if I have a patient like this, I, I think it depends on the patient. Some of the patients will either, I give them the risk-benefit ratio. I mean, there's really no data on that. Um, but um, very often, you know, I'll just ask him if he feels comfortable to continue. And if they want to continue, they will do, do that. I'm not terribly concerned about uh, the, you know, whether to, to stop the, the NOAC in particular. Okay, because I, I've got very few patients now on warfarin, to be fair. Um, the question is, uh, I, I'm actually enlightened by Prof. Kreutz that you know, in this category of patients, you may actually benefit the patients. But again, there's no data on those uh, um, who are in, in, in CKD5 and who need hemodialysis. So sometimes I liaise with the, uh, the nephrologist and more often than not, they say, what are we trying to do? You know, uh, Maybe we have no data. Uh, they're a bit worried about bleeding, then we will probably have to stop it. I mean, this is from a practical so. point. I think I nobody can give you the, the real answer. I'm not sure how uh, um, Prof. Kreutz will, will address this. Yeah. Thanks, David. So we, we have run out of time. So I'd just like to quickly uh, uh, summarize that uh, question again. So if the GFR drops and you have been conscientiously monitoring renal function, firstly, I wouldn't advise a switch, but you do have to dose adjust when the uh, eGFR falls within the range. So that's important and also be more concerned about more regular rise monitoring, figuring out the cause for the drop in EGFR, uh, et cetera. But I personally don't think there's great value in switching. So I, I think we'll come to an hour. Uh, for the last round, I would like each of our panelists to state their learning points for our audience for today. Just uh, one point to take home. So I, I'll perhaps start out with Chi Kyung first. Chi Kyung, a learning point for our audience uh, to take home today before I summarize. All right, learning point is that it is very rather it, you need multiple disciplinary teams or professionals to look after patients with AFib very well to achieve the outcomes that you desire. David, uh, my, my real learning point personally for me is that uh, I've actually learned to understand that from Prof. Kreutz that uh, perhaps you know we can use a NOAC more safely in the stage four to five sort of a CKD, although the evidence is not uh, so robust right now. We have more confidence in it. Thank you. Prof Koitz, you're muted. Sorry, Prof. Uh, maybe you can unmute yourself. If, if you take care of your patients with AF, think about the kidney. It's important. And uh, also for any drug monitoring, if I may say, we need to know the kidney. And uh, in also what uh, David uh, mentioned, you know, I would not include stage five. I would say in those patients down to non-end stage kidney disease, which would include stage four, we have now observational good evidence that 
supports the use of NOACs, particularly 10A inhibitors. Thanks, Prof. Uh, yeah. Okay. My take home message is that uh, atrial fibrillation is getting common and many of them are asymptomatic. So family physicians should really look up for them actively by checking the pulse. And also that I think that we need to raise our confidence in starting and managing NOACs. Because I know it's, it, a lot of my colleagues are a, a bit apprehensive about uh, starting and, and continuing NOACs because it's relatively new. But I think it's been around for long enough. So start getting confident in, in using NOACs. So thanks a lot, uh, everyone, for today's uh, session. I just briefly uh, summarize for the audience. One uh, is no longer a novel oral anticoagulant, and it's been around for a while. Currently, APSC does endorse the use of NOAC O warfarin in terms of stroke prevention and atrial fibrillation. I think the points are well taken. If you have anyone with a chest, chest VAR score of more than one, you should consider anticoagulation. Watch out for the bleeding if the HESPET score is high but uh, the risk benefit will still probably be there in terms of stroke prevention. So Chikyong's talk about 4S and ABC is uh, very well taken. Uh, regards to aggressive uh, control of all the risk factors that make a uh, AI patient uh, worse off, hypertension, diabetes, CKD, obesity, sleep apnea, these are the things that we all have to watch out for. And uh, we probably have to individualize the care to each patient. So again, this is a tricky, naughty conundrum. We heard today that CKD is a major risk factor and those patients down to dialysis are the most uh, underserved and uh, tricky group of patients. I don't have an answer for you in that subgroup, but you probably have to individualize and watch out for events in that group. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, today for the wonderful uh, talks by my three speakers and the comments from my panel. And uh, with that, please uh, keep safe uh, during this pandemic times, and I hope to see you guys soon. Thank you, and goodbye. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.